each horse, is this one inhabited? Well, an inhabited one I can show you. Each horse in their box has, has their, their wraps and their wraps that they use, their, their sheet, and it's all folded in here and clean. These, uh, these valves go to water buckets, like an actual water bucket you use at a horse show. Um, the reason you do that is uh, so you can keep track of how much water they drink. It's hard to keep track with an automatic water unless some of the newer, higher tech ones uh, have a counter um, that tells you. I like this because it's the same cleaning method as when you're at a horse show. Um, the automatic waters seem to never get cleaned. And then you go back there and it's just really swampy water and it's gross. Again, that's another cleanliness thing where, and, and I like being able to look and just see, last time I was here, the water was, was here. Um, I think that's um, simple, or it's, I mean, maybe more time consuming to manually fill, but the reason why you do it is you're continuing to check on your horse um, instead of automating it. And then if they colic, you're like, well, did they drink, how much water did they drink? Well, I don't know. It, you, you know, it's, you need to be able to know that. That's a lot of wires. Watch the dog poop. <laughs> um, all right, that's Tessa. She works here. Um, okay, furthering, you, you know, we, we started with the feed and organizing the feed. And then we go to the, we go to the stalls, we go to the, we go to the tack room. Now let's talk about the cross ties. Again, everything's clean and everything, uh, what, er, you'll meet Eric later. Um, one of my favorite sayings that he says, everything has a place and everything's in its place. So two part, it has a place and in its place. We have to stay very organized here so that, again, the right equipment goes to the right horses. You know, your boots, are all here, and they medium boots, that sort of thing. But they're all here, um, and that also helps so that the grooms aren't running around. Um, and again, keeping everything clean and organized. Um, where should we go next? I mean, what? Yeah. Let's go back to the room. Can we go to the arena? Okay. Where can I go? Is that a better question? Where can I go? Okay, we'll, we'll stand in the barn. Um, okay, so I wanted to give you an overview of how the operation works and why it works that way. Well, now I'll talk about why. So this allows us to keep track of things. I've mentioned it before, and it's, it makes sense, but it also, it, it's really hard to do because it's a bunch of little steps. And so I'll get on, I'll go ride, and 
I can focus on the riding and not have to focus on this stuff on the back end. And then if I feel a difference, then it's easy for me to keep track of what changed uh, or go to find that something I didn't know changed and to figure out what's going on. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. So and it, it's really, do, do any of you guys, uh, when you play sports, you talk about muscle memory a lot. So this is all about creating muscle memory. So all of my saddles, uh, all my saddles are essentially the same except for the panels underneath. So that when I physically sit in the saddle, it feels the same. The stirrups are the same, the stirrup leathers are the same, the uh, stirrup length is the same. And that's all to create muscle memory so that when I'm riding, I can be more precise. If I change the bit every day, it's hard for me to be precise. If I have one saddle with a seat this way, one saddle with a seat that way, it's hard for me to be precise. All of this detail is to create just a constant movement so that when I'm riding, I am able to do it in the most effective way. You know, I'm not struggling, you know, being, and, and if something isn't working, I come back to the barn, I change it a bit, or I change something, and then I go back uh, out. I never, I never stay frustrated, if, if, if it makes sense. You know, you're, if it doesn't feel good, we come back to the barn, make a change, and we go back. Um, do you have any questions? Sure. Hit me. Um, I noticed some equipment in the tractors. Um, do you provide safety on riding tracks? We do. Um, so that is a large expense. Um, we, it actually uh, saves us money um, because, you know, paying a vet to take x rays costs a certain amount of money. And between the barn here and my mom does breeding at another place in Northern California, the number of x-rays we take a year, some basic math, and that machine, which is expensive, pays for itself. Um, and so you're looking, you know, we, and that's the way we, we have a lot of our equipment. It's not just that it saves us money. There's also the benefit of it being here. Like if, if a horse comes out, um, lame one day, we're like, well, A, what changed? And then B, all right, well, let's, if we need to take an x-ray, we just take an x-ray. We, we don't need to call, um, call out. Uh, we, you know, we have, they'll get mad at me if well, we can't do this, but there's, <laughs> we, we do our own P or PRP, IRAP, and stem cell therapies here. And that was shockingly not that expensive. Like what, what, the vet charges for a lot of these equipment, uh, these pieces of equipment, and the PRP side, they pay for themselves in like four treatments. No. <laughs> four, where a lot of them it takes, it takes longer to, to, to pay for itself, but it, you have to take that extra step. Um, I guess my brain does that easily. You know, it's like, so we paid this much for this horse, and I'm complaining about, you, you know what I mean? Like, if, if if you want to keep moving up, it, it's those little, you don't need an x-ray machine, absolutely not. Like, and I would never ever say that, but that's why we do it. And when, when the whole team is on the road, uh, we, we have another scale that travels with us, that's with me out east. We'll, we'll travel with the x-ray machine, we'll travel um, for the same reason. You, you know, it allows us to deliver care to our horses faster and more accurately. Um, and to keeping them more consistent. You know, it's very rare that, well, very rare. You're going to meet Philippe later. Um, almost never do we have a horse come out one day not sound in an area we couldn't have predicted would be their area. You know, like, you might have a right knee issue. And so, like, if the horse comes out lame, we pretty much know. You know like, we would know, like, it's a known place of weakness for the horses. Um, that also allows us to work on preventing it. You know, we don't wait um, for another way. The reason we, all these things are so controlled is so that we can prevent problems from happening. 
Um, we have base radiographs on all the horses. We have, we, you'll meet Philippe Arvet later, we jog them at least once a month. Now we can do that, he works for us on contract, so he doesn't, we don't call him when we have a problem. It's more of a constant work, so that we're not, the idea is we're preventing a problem from becoming a problem. Um, and we'll do, we'll do a lot of our regenerative treatments before they're really lame. Because we don't want them to be, you know, we don't want to wait till they get there. Like if, um, and I think that's really key for us in keeping them consistent is, you, you know, a lot of times you wait until the horse is actively lame before you call the vet. Um, and a lot of time, and almost always, 99.99% of the time, you could have seen it before that day. Um, and, it, and it shows up before that day. So for me, and being able to compete as often as I do and to keep the horses consistent, we have to check them often. Um, you know, that it's another way that things like the water buckets plays out to the higher levels. You know, you're checking the water often as we do checking the horses often. Um, and later we'll talk about, when, when, when Philippe comes, we'll talk about what we're doing when we're jogging the horses, what we're looking for, and how when I get on a horse, at least well, a couple times a week, what I'll do is I'll jog them in a straight line on the hard ground while I'm on them, and I'll do circles on the hard ground both directions, basically to check how they're feeling. You know, instead of just assuming that they feel a certain way, you know, uh, just check to see how they feel, and then we go for a long walk before we ride, or before we, uh, before we start work. But those little, those little things all build up to keeping the horses consistent. Because, um, at least for me, the worst feeling is when you come into the barn and something is completely different than the day before. You know, and it's, it sucks because like you're, 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 you're feeling good, you're making progress, and all of a sudden it's like, bam. And so all this stuff is designed to minimize that. Um, and I'm not allowed to walk there. <laughs> okay. I, we have a really good case study from last year, and actually the machine just showed up uh, a couple days ago. So we'll, we'll see it but physically, but I can talk about it without. So we were on the road last year, and uh, one of my horses, actually two of them, they're kind of sensitive when they travel. Um, they get pretty stressed out, and their incidence of colicky episodes is a lot higher. Um, so we went down this deep, dark rabbit hole about how do we still travel, but how do, what can we change and improve to make them travel better? And the only way you can answer that is by knowing, by knowing the variables involved. Again, we go back to how they're fed, when they're fed. Um, and so we, okay, well, they're, they're fed consistently. They're fed six times a day, um, so we can't really change that. Um, that was the first element we looked at. And then they, we noticed at some places when they had a small stall, that increased the stress load. You go to a new place, smaller stall, so okay. Then we double stalled it. Okay, that made it a little bit better, but it didn't solve the problem. Um, then, um, we noticed that uh, at some places they didn't drink their water as much. Um, so here goes the rabbit hole. Well, we're already, we're already starting down it. So then we said, okay, well, we got to put electrolytes in their water. So all the horses do get electrolytes. Um, you know, the powders that you generally put in the, in the feed, we put in the water. Honestly, its a f effect physically is the same, but we put it in the water to try and help increase their water consumption. Um, because at some shows, the water doesn't taste very good. And that works for some horses, but not all of them. And then we put apple juice or Gatorade or, you know, all sorts of things just to try and get them to drink their water. And it was the last variable that we were able to control. And so, okay, well then if the water tastes bad, and they, let's, let's filter the water. So we bought, you know, cheap filters. That works sort of. 
but it didn't work all the way and we'd still had some issues. So we, and filtering just removes stuff from water. And depending on what you start with, you know, you're not, you're just reducing the flavor, you're not really changing it. You know, it'd be like a diluting Coke. It's still Coke, it's just watered down Coke. Um, and so we still had an issue. So the solution, which I'll come to in a minute, was only, we were only able to get there because we stepped along a long path of what were the variables, what were the possible things we could change to improve these issues we were having on the road. And that can only happen if you have known variables. You know they're being fed consistently. You know that all this stuff. So the solution, it's a water filter, but this one is unique in that it, it, it strips everything out of the water. And then it goes through another system where it remineralizes it with what we know. So it basically creates the same water no matter what you put into it. The output's the same wherever it comes from. But again, that's an extreme, you know, that's going all the way to the extreme, and we're only able to do that because of all the foundation down below, all that boring stuff, you know. And is that machine really required? No, you know, even for me, it's not required, but if it can help these two horses travel easier, that means they'll show easier, that means that, you know, our stress levels when we travel are lower, uh, you know, it can do a lot of good things. Um, uh, another case study, we had uh, another one, uh, back to the feed, we had a horse that just kept colicking. And nothing, nothing bad, you know, it didn't, we didn't go to the clinic. Um, you know, we, we keep a lot of uh, uh, vet supplies here so we can do our own, our own care. So if we need, you know, um, banamine or buscapan or anything like that, we have it here. Um, and, and the grooms are all trained on how to, how to administer. But just kept colicking. And so I, I said, Philippe, what can we do to reduce this? Instead of, you know, just saying, well, this horse colics a lot. It's like, what can we do to reduce this? And so that's what, and then be willing to make those changes. What we changed in that case was we feed six times a day. Um, we feed uh, grain first, then an hour later the hay. And, and we do that so they have more meals. The hay is after the grain, so it pushes the grain through the, the horse's system. And also the hay, they kind of nibble on over time. So they're doing something for a longer period of time and feeding them more consistently reduces your chances of colic. So it wasn't just asking the question, what can we do to reduce it? but also making the change and keeping the change made. And actually, in that case, she didn't colic again until we retired her. I mean, she didn't colic when she retired, but like. Um, so, but we had to make that change, and that change is, you know, and a lot of times those changes can be hard because they're used to doing it one way. Um, <sighs> How far can we walk? Okay, well, uh, the corner part already, already. Yeah. Okay. 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 Do you guys have any questions? Correct. Um, and then uh, the morning and after morning and afternoon grain has the supplements in it. Uh, that helps logistically. Breaking it up into three pieces, the 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 supplements just it's easier just to have a little bit of grain in a, in a bucket for for lunch. Um, uh, and then we also will make the grain once a day. So we'll make it all once a day, and then uh, uh, because it's just easier to do on a time management side for the for the grooms. Um, but yeah, okay. hit me. So when you make these like adjustments, right? So if there's a horse that happened to drink the water, right, and you're making it over 
you make it over just that one horse, like how logistically do you, do you do that? Because then you've got every horse on a different schedule. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. <laughs> so how do you keep that consistency? I change it for everyone. So you change it for yeah, everyone? Yeah. So everyone operates on like a semi. Correct. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are some cases where some, you know, it doesn't make sense to change it for all of them. Mm -hmm. But in like the water case, you make it for everyone. Um, you know, I'll do, you know, we'll even, I'll be riding and I'll feel, you know, the horses not work, it doesn't feel like they have enough energy and we'll make feed changes to give them more energy okay. or vice versa. We'll make feed changes to give them less energy. Um, and we can do that accurately because back to the, talk about the feed a lot, sorry, but like everything like always starts there and then we, we build back from there. You know, we'll give them a third of a scoop more. And that's a very, very small adjustment, um, but that's an adjustment we're able to do because of our scoop, and we don't want to feed them too much more. We don't want to make them fat. Um, or if we're giving them more energy, we might not just feed them more. We might reduce one element of their feed and increase another. So we have, we have four different feed um, grains that we feed, and then we can play with the amounts of them because some are hotter than others, meaning giving them more energy than others. So we can kind of, you know, we can tune it that way. Um, yeah. Um, Gil, do you, you, you could, you could go, Gil. Oh, yeah. Um, let's walk straight so that he can. Um, and I can't go in the tack room. Let me get a saddle. I'm going to go grab a saddle and we'll. We talked about bits. Well, let's talk about saddles. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not saying. I would never say you have to ride in one brand, and that's not what I'm saying. We're going to talk about why saddles should fit a certain way, and then you can make your decisions. You know, I, I think teaching a framework for how to how to think allows you to then go from there instead of saying use this. You know that that gives you way less information. So, you know, we talked about, we're, we're coming up the, the track of information, and then obviously the afternoon we'll get to riding. But all this stuff, the reason why I want to do it this way is so that you have to build this whole thing so you can ride correctly. So, saddle, this is the ones we use, but we're going to talk about saddle fit. So, for me, there has to be a lot of room here, more than most saddles. Now, the reason why that is, is because you know you have the, the the spinous process, the bones that come up in the spine, and you don't want to put weight on that. Makes sense. But on the left and right side is a bunch of fascia. Fascia are kind of like, it's what attaches the muscles to the bones. And you also don't want to put weight on that. And so you have to have saddles that are wider than most. And then also, for me, the panel should be bigger. Um, you can see how big these panels are. Now, that makes intuitive sense because you're dispersing your weight over a larger area. Um, and so what we'll do is we have, like I said, all, all the saddles here, thankfully Eric and I, are the, we ride in the same saddle, all the panels are the same, all the seats are the same. Um, and so we'll make changes, so the, then we can make a saddle change dependent on the horse, because the saddle has to fit the horse first. Um, and then we'll, we'll label it for the horse, and then we also check every so often to make sure the saddle is still fitting the horse, because it might fit two months ago, but it might not fit today. Um, you know, if you get a you get a horse in, 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 that's very skinny, and you're building up the muscle gets stronger, or they have an injury and then they have you know two months off and then you're riding them again, their bodies are going to be shaped differently. And so it's really important that you keep track of that so that the saddle is not putting pressure on the spine. 
Um, and also what helps with this, with the panels being bigger here, is I don't have to use some crazy pads. You know, the, you see back riser pads or front riser pads. It's all very basic because the work is done in the saddle. There are some small adjustments we make um, with the pads, but that's when we don't have a saddle that fits 100% correctly and we're waiting for its replacement. Um, um, does that all make sense? Any questions? Good. Um, also, you'll see the, this is like, I hate the, you know the saddles with this like two different leathers here and it always wears and it's just, like I get it because people want their saddles to break in faster. Like I get that, but they also break faster. <laughs> if they break in faster, they break faster. So these are just awful to break in. Like they, the, 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 the seats are, it feels like you're sitting on wood and the panels, your leg is swinging all over the place. But once they're broken in, they last, you, you know, they last for, for forever. And I think that's, so it's much better value for the money you spend, you know. Um, yeah. Um, do you ever get uh, custom saddles for specific horses? Yes. You do? Yeah. Um, oh, just repeat that question. Oh. Since you have a mic. Um, do you ever have specific saddles built for specific horses? Um, yeah. So the saddle doesn't fit. If I don't have a saddle that fits a horse, we will we'll fit get one fit for that horse. But instead of thinking it so much as this one's custom made for this horse, this saddle's designed to fit this type of back. Right. And so if you have another horse with a, a similar back type, then it's for that ho type of horse. Um, and I think it's easier to think of it that way. And then also, even if it's custom fit for your horse, when it shows up, you gotta check. Right. You, you know, we've had plenty of them come and they don't fit. Um, or they fit right out of the gate, and then they stop fitting. Um, because also saddles wear. So over time, you know, there's a, there's a piece of metal here, and then there's wood in the tree. Over time, A, the padding can, can get more squishy, and B, the tree can move over time. And so it might have fit perfectly in the beginning, but because the saddle changed, and the, assuming the horse stayed the same, the saddle no longer fits. And that, that some, some brands, are tougher than others, um, but they all move over time. Um, it's, and it doesn't mean your saddle doesn't fit, it just means it doesn't fit anymore. Um, and you know, it's important to have a good relationship with your, with your saddler so that you can trade in the saddle and get a, get a new one. Um, yeah, I hate when you see people with these huge pads on their horses. Also from a riding side, I want it to feel the same for me. The reason why that's so important is so that when I sit in the saddle, First, it fits the horse, of course, rhyming there. Um, but also, when I sit in the saddle, I feel good. I'm not six miles away from them, and I can actually do my job. It, um, and yeah. And then we all we do the same with our bridles. Let me grab a bridle. Oh God, damn it! I don't know her tack trunk code. Tessa, what's your tack trunk code? Three three eight six. Okay. Yeah. She just had. Yeah, that'll. No, oh, fuck it. Yeah, that won't work. Beautiful. Okay. All right. These things took a while to make, so we couldn't find bridles that we liked. And again, this is going over things that you're, you, you guys know, but for us, we were like, we need to change it because it, was, it would help us out. 
So we're moving on from the saddles to the bridles. So to the point we, you see, we ride in flat leather reins. Um, A, uh, because if you need that much grip while you're flatting, there's a deeper problem. The problem, the solution to the problem isn't change your reins. It's, or I need more grippy reins. It's the flat work itself in the bit. So there's no need for more grip than a flat leather rein. Also, they last forever. <laughs> They're cheaper and they last forever. You know, it's like those little things that like, I've, I've never had to replace a flat leather rein because they wore out. Um, actually, I've never had to replace any of them because I haven't broken any of them yet. Um, they last forever and that's, that's good. You know, you're, I hate sticky rubber. I hate when it wears. It's just gross. Like we all know that feeling and so it's a simple solution. Then next we had these bridles made and one of the big things we wanted to change is, you know, you're, you have your bridle and um, you're tightening the nose band and uh, one more is too tight and one less is not tight enough. I think we've all struggled with that. The thing that's crazy is the solution is so easy. Just punch the holes closer together. Like if you see how close those are punched, you know, they're all punched close together. Um, and we do that on the whole thing. Even the, your cheek pieces are all punched close together. So when you're doing your bit height adjustment, you know, you're not running into that because that's the worst is when you're not having it at the right place. And that's a detail that we found that we said we have to have them made and then having them made sure it was expensive but we haven't broken a leather's much better than other ones and we haven't broken them you know they last for a long time but it's taking that step in to figure out what bridle allows me to do the work that I want allows me to adjust it the way that I want lasts and allows also allows for comfort in the horse we put the strap above um, uh, and that also, it keeps the bit in the same place. You know, some, the bridles, when the crown piece goes, uh, uh, when the, whatever, goes underneath, you put the bridle on, it's all wonky. And then every time you put the bridle on, you have to, like, rejigger it. It's much nicer when it just stays in place. <laughs> you, you know, but again, that's, that's thinking about the, the, all these little steps that make the process of getting ready to go ride and riding easier. Um, then we had double bridle, bridles made, and some other stuff. It's fun. Um, and then, of course, we do use uh, rubber reins when we, ride, when we show, but I, I don't like riding them on the flat for the reasons I noted. Also, the reason why these are as thick as they are. Have you guys ever ridden in two reins? Okay. The second rein is generally very small, correct? It is impossible to hold. And so to hold, what you then start doing is you start clenching your fist. But you can't ride accurately with a, with a fist clenched. So these are designed to be a certain width, uh, so that they're the same as the rubber rein, so you can just, they sit in your hand. And that helps, again, that's a little detail to help your feel. Um, and I will actually, I'll change my reins depending on what I want. If I don't want to change the bit, I'll actually change reins. I'll go to a thinner rein. I have thicker rubber reins. I have thinner rubber reins. So I can change, and especially when you do use two reins, the relationship between the two reins changes how the bit operates, or how you operate the bit. And so it's, you could make a bit very different depending on the reins you use. Um, and in our show backpack, we always have the full like, set, if you will. So if I don't like what I'm feeling, then you know, we can change the reins. Does that make sense? Any questions? Also, look at, look at the bridle. Is that dirty? No, no, not at all. This gets used every single day, and we've probably had this one for about eight years. And these are expensive. Keep them clean so that you, the money you spent lasts. And, you, you know, the same... I don't know when the last time this was used, but they get put away clean. Because um, again, we all know it, saddles are expensive. So it, it takes a little extra step, or it takes a little extra time. Um, we can actually talk about tack cleaning later. They don't want me to go to the cross ties. 
<laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, so yeah, any questions? Um, I have a question going back to the saddle. Um, what uh, the com uh, is it, mayor? Or, mm -hmm. uh, why do you ride in those saddles? Yes, that is a good question. Because um, I believe um, John French also rides in those saddles. Yes. So the reason we ride in the, so we all know that saddle seats are different. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, A, the, the most basic stuff, I like how they fit the horses. That's, that's the first thing. But not even a fantastic saddle won't fit every horse. Um, I think we all inherently know that. But um, so first, when they fit, I like how they fit the horses. Um, two, they last. You know, I like the leather and the construction. I can't remember the last time we've worn through a saddle. I think we've only worn through one saddle. Um, and then the final reason is how it feels for me, the rider. Um, so we have to get through those steps. So you probably all have a preference of seat or you've heard of, you, you know, you've tried different saddles and say, I don't really like this seat, I like this seat or that seat. For me, I like this seat. Um, uh, take a step back. You're used to talking about seats in shallow or deep. but. That's not the whole story. It's the physical shape of it. Uh, it's not just shallow or deep. These saddles, the way the seat is designed, it's more of a V shape instead of a U. So it is tech, it's a mid to deep seat, but it doesn't ride like one. Um, also, the V puts you in one place. So when you sit in the saddle, you know, your, your butt hits one place and it stays there. Um, if you don't like that place, then oof. Um, <laughs> But you know, you don't, in, in these, I don't move forward or back. You know, you're kind of planted in one place. And that helps with muscle memory, helps, for me, I just like that feeling. Um, also, the seat is wide in this direction. Um, so I don't feel, some of the shallower seats, it's a bit like sitting on a two by four. And it's just not really that fun. <laughs> uh, you know, I just don't want to do that all day. No, sure, if you tack walk a horse, in one of these for like 45 minutes to an hour, your butt's gonna be sore. You know, they're not Western saddles. But they're a lot more comfortable uh, for me uh, than, than the ones that are in this direction very rolled. I just, it, pushing on parts that I don't want to push on. <laughs> but the big, the big reason is that, that V shape that I talked about. Um, and feeling like you're always gonna hit one place. And if you move your seat into a different place, it feels wrong. And I, I like that there's, you know, like a right answer. Um, yeah. Is there another one? You answered my question about the seat depth. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Um, yeah, let me put these away now. Ugh. Now I want to go out to the ring. <sighs> God, there's stuff I need to talk about at the ring before we start riding. Hmm. Is there anything you guys want to see before? Huh? Huh? <laughs> the ring. God, Brooke. I think you should just hold the mic permanently. <laughs> um, besides riding, do you do um, any personal workouts or any? Yes, yes, I do. Um, so I do, I do run, um, but that's more. It's not so much. None of it is so much for like physical to help me physically ride. Okay. 
um, I don't want to be stronger. Yeah. You, you know, like I don't do strength training. Yeah. Now, granted, I'm a six foot one guy, a shorter person, maybe, but I don't want to be stronger because if you're stronger, then you use strength too much. Correct. I want to be weaker, so I don't have that option. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's better to not have the option than to have control over that option. Um, but I do, uh, I do balance training um, a lot, and I work uh, do do it over Zoom with a with a um, Norwegian lady. Um, but basically, the, the idea is. So, what we do, we have a couple of different um, uh, things. One, one's a very long mat that's about yay thick and very squishy, and so it makes it harder to do stuff. And so basically what, what you're doing is working on body alignment and your balance. So when I go onto my right leg, it should be the same as my left leg, and I should be able to you know, do all these motions, and then we'll twist, and I'm and I only twist, you know, done correctly, I'm only twisting my shoulders over, my hips are staying independent. Um, and that's a really big thing. We can, we can play a little bit at lunch, but in, the reason why I do that is A, being aligned is important. You know, putting weight correctly in both left and right sides so that you can turn left and right better. I'm sure, do you guys have issues like one way is harder to turn? So a lot of time, sometimes that might be a horse thing, you, you know, specific to that horse. But a lot of times it's also you, the rider. And a lot of times that has to do with your alignment and how you move right versus left. So this is tackling those tendencies um, so that I'm more aligned. The other thing it, the balance training does is it helps improve my... Um, uh, um, body independence. If I'm, another one of the exercises we do, I'll be balancing on, on one foot on the mat, or I'll be on a foam roller, you know, a hard foam roller, you know, use on your IT bands, or on a BOSU ball, and I'll have a ball thrown at me. And the point is, I need to catch the ball without catching the ball. You know, I, having my arm be independent, and, you know, the reason we work on that is when you're riding, you need to be able to do what you need with your hands or your seat or whatnot without destabilizing the rest of the system. Each piece needs to be independent. Um, and so that really, actually I started doing it um, beginning of this year and it really, uh, it really helps. Um, yeah, should have brought out the chair. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll play with that, but it's really one of the hardest things to learn when you're, when you're going up is how to keep your body independent. So you're riding, and you want to use your, uh, use your right leg. You have to be able to do it on time and without moving your seat. And being able to do that is hard. And further from that, the harder one is a lot of people, they require weight in the hand to maintain their own body balance. A horse can never be light if it's also holding you. And they, they won't let themselves, because you're asking them to do a job, and they are doing it. You know, they are holding you up. And so being able to get that independence then allows so much other stuff to happen. But that's, that's the balance training and, and, and whatnot. But I really, for me personally, I don't, and I, I would say for the majority of people, there's not a strength component to training for riding. Um, I think you need to be fit, sure, but it's not like a, you know, I need to be able to pull as hard as I can or, you know, increase the strength of my thigh. Like, that's not a thing that I really think about. Um. Um, do you use any therapies on your horses, for example, like the femur or acupuncture? Yes. So, we'll, we'll start it now. <laughs> so... Um, I'm lucky because my vet that we use, that uh, uh, his wife is also a board certified vet, and she does all the um, body work on the horses. Um, and I say body work because she'll, if they need some adjustment, chiropractic, she'll do that. If they need, you know, massage, she'll do that. Acupuncture. Um, 
she'll do all that. Now, one, one thing we don't do is none of the people, no one that works on the horses does it in an island. You know, the chiropractor doesn't come, start doing stuff on horses, and then get in their car and leave. You know, a lot of it is, which, which is a pretty normal thing. You know, every time they, A, we, we only do the body work stuff once a month um, because too much of it can be a bad thing. It, well, and it's expensive. Um, and also, after the work was done, we get a report on each horse, what was felt, what was done, what if sometimes uh, they need a day off after. So we know that, and we get that report that same day so that we can adjust the horse's schedule for the next day. Um, I will also go to her, Kate, she might be here today, um, and say, hey, can you look at this horse and tell me what you think? And a lot of times I'll do that because the feeling I have is different. And so without giving her what I'm feeling, I say, what do you see? And she, you know, she's worked on the horses for however long we've had them, so she knows the horse as well and can, can look that way. Um, as for therapies, we do use a lot of therapies. We use a thing called an FES, um, stands for functional electrostimulation. Um, ultrasound, uh, therapeutic ultrasound, not a, a Obviously, an imaging one is for imaging. Um, those are the two big ones, really. Um, we obviously ice. Um, we don't use a beamer or any magnetic therapy. Uh, I don't think they work. Um, did a video on them. I also don't think vibrating plates work, um, so we don't use those, but really the, the ultrasound and, and the FES, we can do pretty much everything we, we need. We do have some, have you seen those like smaller vibrating, the handheld vibrator things? We do use that sometimes on some, for some very specific stuff, and we're always very specific. We're using the FES on this horse for this reason, um, and you can change, FES I like because you can change how you use it to do different things. Um, from relaxing muscle to strengthening it. Um, but, yeah, those are the big ones. So, Carl, we're going to take a 15-minute break, if you don't mind, and then we'll do the cross talk so we can reset. Okay. Yeah, Carl just said that. Mm -hmm. You want to just break? let oh. everyone know? Yeah, yeah we're going to take a 15-minute break, then we'll come back to the cross ties. <laughs> <laughs> and we throw it to the producer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, all right. One of my biggest pet peeves is when I see people with dirty tack. And even if you're not the one who cleans your tack, you still own it. And it's your, you know, it's still value, you know, you own it, so it should be taken care of well. And I can't have you guys here without, without doing this because it's just, tack is really easy to clean. It's really easy. And it doesn't take that much time, but doing it right is important. So we use glycerin soap here. This is the Steuben brand, or you can use the, you know, the bar glycerin. It's whichever you want. Um, the big thing that most people, why they don't use glycerin soap is they say, oh, it builds up on the leather. Sure, if you just keep applying it, it will build up. It's like if you just put on lotion but never took a shower. You know, like, <laughs> the, that you, would never, you would never do that. So we'll do this before we go out to the ring, and then we'll, this is going to be fun. Um, we literally will just, there's no soap on this, and we will rub down the whole bridle um, because water is great at getting rid of a lot of that stuff. And then after that, we will apply a little bit of the soap to the sponge with, yeah, this is the sponge I like. Um, it's important to rub everything off first because there's stuff that was on it, um, both the glycerin soap that you applied and, you know, soap and all that. So we literally just with water will clean the whole bridle. And then we'll come with glycerin soap with a little bit on a very dry towel so it doesn't bubble. Because if you've used it ever, you know that it, it bubbles quite a lot. And we, again, will rub down the whole bridle. Very simple. But done correctly, the bridles last, last forever. Um, the other thing we don't, the other product here is a leather conditioner. Leather conditioner is literally just wax and oil. Um, just like you would oil your tack, it's just wax and oil. Um, people in general make their equipment too soft. Um, and so, meaning they use too much oil or too often. We will only ever do it if it looks like it needs it. We don't, have, we don't have any schedule like that. If you weaken, if you soften it too much, you're weakening it. And then it's more prone to breaking. Also, in a bridle, you don't need it to be very supple, except for the reins, which you're holding in your hand. There's not any big folding, like, you know, like a, like a catcher's mitt. There's a lot, you know, baseball mitt, there's a lot of movement. In a bridle, there isn't. So you don't need it to be super soft. And same with a saddle. You know, I've seen, have you ever seen a person's uh, leg flap of their saddle, like, move back behind them? that obviously doesn't help when you're riding. You, you know, you, you then have a panel out of, the pla out, out of place and it makes riding harder. Um, and people get so over the top about what products they use or don't use, but really it's just, for me, it's just water. It's so, like, it, that's why I had, I had to say something because it's so simple, yet, and, and it protects your investment. You know, it, if you're gonna spend money on a bridle, it should last. And especially if you have good leather, then it basically won't break. Um, I just I had to do that. I couldn't like not do it because I just see it wrong so much and I, I hate it. Um, I think we should go to the ring because after lunch, we're gonna do some more stuff in the ring. So there's some preparatory things that we should maybe do first. Um, so let's walk to the ring.
Um, maybe before we start, are there any specific things in this area you want me to cover? Or any specific? Footing. 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 What about footing? So, uh, again, this is more of, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll teach you how to think, not a particular brand, um, because there's a lot of misconceptions around, around a brand and their output. Um, uh, I guess first you probably have heard GGT uh, a lot, or GGT footing. Um, that is wrong, because GGT stands for German Geotextile. Mm -hmm. It's literally byproduct from the German roofing industry. Um, only reason we don't use American stuff because we produce the same stuff as old asbestos rules and other stuff. But it has nothing to do with sand. So you can blend GGT in with whatever you want and you'll have different, uh, different footings. Um, I think um, this arena is a ebb and flow arena so it all comes from underneath. Uh, the, you know, what, what Thermal uh, built we we built this one because all the other companies don't do that great of a job. Um, I think the most important thing to remember for footing is at home, well, always you want it to be consistent. Now it might be, I might ride here, I might go trot on the dirt road over there, and the dirt road is hard, but it's consistently hard. You know, I'm not going from hard to deep to hard. Um, and it's important to, as best as you can, work in a variety of, uh, of different footings to a certain degree. You know, don't go trotting on, uh, you know, a hard road for 30 minutes. But a certain amount is important for the horses for their proprioception. Um, and when you go between two footings, it's important to be careful if there's a big change because horses don't adjust. Uh, the easiest way to explain it is if you just get to the beach, you get super excited, you're running on the asphalt, and then you get to the sand, and before your foot hits the ground on the sand, you already say, I'm about to hit sand, and you've adjusted how you're moving. Horses don't make that adjustment. So imagine running to the sand and stepping on the sand like you think it's asphalt before you make an adjustment. You know, like that, that's what horses are doing because they're not making that adjustment. So you have to make the adjustment for them by just, you know, paying attention a little bit. Um, I think when we're talking footing at home, like arena footing, I think it needs to be softer than your show footing um, because you don't need as much from the footing um, at home as you do at the show because uh, you're, not, you're not turning super hard at home uh, like you do in the ring. You're also not jumping, uh, you know, 50, 100, 200 horses in, in your home arena. You know, so it, there's different requirements, um, and I think in general it needs to be uh, to be softer. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll we'll adjust that. We'll like if we know we're going to a, a show with with hard, like particularly hard footing, you know, we can make this arena uh, harder uh, so that there's a little bit of a heads up. You know, we're not just cold going in cold. Um, but yeah, I I honestly. It sounds weird, but I don't really think about the footing as much. You know, is this the nicest footing? No. Does it have a lot of fines in it? Yeah. Does it compact too much? Sure. But, you know, you just know how to manage it. it it's not a, footing's not a monolith. You know, people say, oh, it's nice footing or it's not nice footing. You can make really good sand bad. You, you know, meaning you could, it, it, in an arena, it could be really a great blend of sand, but if you don't manage it well, it can be bad and you can manage not very good sand and make it much better. So I, you know, there's not, like I said, there's not good and bad. There's, there's conditions you're trying to d design towards um, given what you're trying to do. Um, does that answer your question? Any other question on footing? Great. Um, okay, so, you know, we've done all of our work in the barn and we have all that stuff set. We, you know, we take our horse for a walk and then we come into the ring. Now, for me, you know, there's, there's, there's a few types of work that we'll do. You know, there's your just, you know, walk, trot, loose, walk, trot, canter, just loose work. 
Then there's your more heavier flat work where you're really training both them physically, because flat work is also a physical training of their bodies, and mentally to get their, rea you, you know, to work so you understand how to get the reactions you want um, out of them. Um, and then we'll do uh, pull exercises, and then we do have a course built here, because uh, Eric wanted to build a course before we went to Temecula. Um, but we really don't jump courses that often, because we're, a course can be distracting. Um, we'll work more in pieces. You know, we'll work on a particular part of a course. You know, we just came back from a show, and we had issues um, pushing out of a combination. I'm not gonna jump a course with a combination in it to work on that. I'm gonna work on just a combination. So we'll break things up into pieces, uh, and also depending on what we are doing. Um, I think too often when people jump at home, they're just jumping and it's, it's you know, there's not a purpose uh, in, in place. Um, and also when we're jumping, it's very important with exercises, it's not just the exercise you're jumping, it's how you approach the exercise. Um, because you can, if you're in a, I mean a really easy way to say it is if you're in a gallop versus a collected canter, that exercise is going to be wildly different. You know, you might flip over at, at a collected canter, but you might survive in a gallop. You, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, so you need, it's not just the exercise, it's how you do the exercise. Um, what we do do a lot of are pulls. Um, and we basically have, we have, we build a lot, but they're very simple. And uh, later in the afternoon, Eric is gonna ride this three pole line. Um, this is our standard line. Um, this is basically the line that taught me how to ride. Um, but it is simple. You will survive. It's not about surviving, you know, the course or the exercise. Um, it's about doing it correctly. And since they're poles, the poles don't act on you, uh, act on you or your horse as much. And so it is more telling how you do than a jump, because a jump will back the horses off. It's easier to get a distance to a 160 fence than it is to a vertical. Um, and also what's great about poles is you could do them over and over and over and over again. So if you only have one horse, you're limited in your practice you can do. And so you can't jump as much. Well this you could do over and over and over again and you're not negatively stressing your horse. You know, you're not adding big impacts, you're not adding all of that, and so you can practice so much more. The thing with pulls is, surviving a pull is easy, but, and so it maybe is not that exciting because it doesn't have that same rush of like, you know, jumping a course. And at the end of the course, you're really like, oh my God, I, I did, I'm so happy I, I did the course. But with the pulls, you are acting on it. You know, you're saying this is the canter I want to use, and you're actively picking that canter. You're picking your your turn, and the pole isn't backing your horse off. So you have to actively do every part. And so if you do it right, it's a lot more telling, or doing it the way that you want. You know, if you decide to do, um, this is set at 20 meters, or 65 feet, 7 inches. Um, and that's very, we, we set it that way every time, because it's a standard. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, like a, like a ruler is, a, is 12 inches. You know, it's always 12 inches. Um, the pole, the, this line is always the same, regardless of the horse we're doing. Um, but you have to work the exercise intentionally. You have to say, I want to do seven strides. Before you approach it, you have your canter for seven. You just go over the pole and you keep cantering. And it, from when you make your turn to the very end, your canter is the same. You're maintaining that same canter. And so the exercise is getting the canter right, being able to hold a powerful canter in seven, and a canter that you can also jump out of. You have to imagine that you're jumping, um, even though you're not. Um, so what I think would be fun is maybe we walk it. Well, no, we don't need to walk it. So the way, w the way I'll set this, and the reason we're talking about this is this is probably the most, Im this is the most important exercise I do with all of my horses. I set it wherever I go, um, and if, if I'm on course and I had some issues uh, with some of the strides, like something was shorter than I was expecting, 
or it was not as short as I was expecting, what I will then do is I'll come back and I'll do this line to basically get my gauge in my head of like, if I'm doing, if it's a, if it's a steady seven, I can expect it to ride this way. And I can do that because of this line. And so that allows me then to walk more accurately. So again, if, it, if I walk and I say, oh, the seven, it's not gonna be that steady for me. But then I ride it and it's very steady, then I've, I've misinterpreted the line and or I misinterpreted how my horse is cantering. So then I go home and I do this to basically get my gauge right so that when I go back, it's more accurate and so I'm caught out of, I'm caught out less likely. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Great. So when we walk, what we'll do, when I, when I set this, I will walk with my feet because that also is a gauge for me to test if I'm walking with the right step. Because um, we all walk four steps, but we're actually making a measurement with those four steps. So it's important to gauge that your step is accurate. So I'll walk it with my feet and then I'll take a tape and I will measure it. And then I will know how close or far I am. And then I will, uh, as again, my own gauge, and then I will, with the measurement, I will then move it to the correct measurement, and then I will walk it again. Just so that, again, I'm gauging it out so that when I'm walking a course, I know, you know, I've, I, I have a known distance, and I walk it, I know I can walk it with this, these steps, and then when I walk it for the horse on course, I know, you know, it's, it's setting these, and we're furthering all that foundation stuff we did in the barn, you're setting all these things so that when it comes time to show, because that's what we're, we're here doing, you have all these pieces in place so you can basically just play. Play, I mean like press play, not like have fun play. It is fun. It's fun when you're prepared. Um, okay, so I think we'll talk about how this line is used. So first off, it's used to used in a consistent manner. You're doing, you're doing seven and seven, six and six, five and five, and the goal is to do that while keeping your horse engaged and in a frame. And a frame is not a physical thing. You know, people think a frame is, you know, getting the horse's head bent. A frame is, for me, a frame and a connected horse are essentially, could be used interchangeably. And you want to keep your horse connected and not strung out like this. It's very hard to jump a whole course smoothly and with the right strides if the canter is like this. So it's keeping everything armed and engaged um, in doing seven and seven, six and six, five and five. Now some horses with a bigger stride, the seven and seven will be harder. With some horses with smaller strides, the five and five will be harder than the seven and seven. But you never change the exercise because the strides on course don't you know, it, once you could do that smoothly, then we start to change. So we will do six and seven, five and six, um, and at the very end, five and seven. And the goal there is again, the canter you pick doesn't change when you approach the pole. You do six strides, and the goal is to make that addition quickly and smoothly without in an ideal world, now I know physically this is impossible, but it's important to, to visualize, to make the shortening happen to do seven, shortening the steps, but not slowing down. So basically you're taking that same energy that is in six, and you're basically elevating that energy. You're redirecting it upwards. And the reason why that's important is you need that energy in a tight line to then jump the fence that you're about to approach. You know, if you just slow down, you're losing power, and then you got a big oxer there, you don't have enough energy to jump it. So it's not about just physically doing six and seven. It's about doing six and seven the right way and in a way that will yield best chances of you jumping clear. Um, we don't do the exercise the other way where we start seven to six. Or, or we, you know, where we leave out, we go, you know, six to five or any of that. We don't do it that way because 
you almost never see that on course, and it does, it can teach, you know, you, we just don't do it. There's not really a use for it. Um, and we will do this back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over again. Um, because it really, it is the gauge, and I would rather, if I had a choice, I would rather have four poles than be able to jump before I went to a show of any height because it's so much more helpful for me to do poles than it is to jump. And jumping is really, is only to work on a tweak of how a horse jumps, not the right ability. You've already done the right ability here. Um, and so you're just tweaking, you know, how, how a horse jumps one particular exercise. Um, uh, example would be uh, in the three-star uh, Grand Prix in Thermal Week 2 that I did, I had a rail with one of my mares. It was B of a double. And it's great what she does. She jumps into the combinations and she really drives through the combinations. But she did too much and we had B down. So then my work after that was to jump a combination to try and work on her not pushing too hard through it. I'm working on an individual exercise based off of what happened uh, at the last show. I'm not just jumping willy-nilly. You know, everything is intentional. I mean, you can see from the barn to here, everything is intentional. Um, and then before, you know, if I feel we... I don't really do this because there's not that much time in between when I show generally, but if I feel like we need some more jumping, what we'll do is I'll jump smaller. You know, I'll jump one meter ten, but I'll you know, just so the horse get it, because it also helps physically for the horses um, to to jump instead of just cold cocking straight into the show. But that is more of a physical work than a training. Um, any questions? I got a question. Yes. Do we have questions? I don't think so. <laughs> um, so. This is just the single exercise. Then we, what we'll do is we'll expand that exercise by adding more, not by changing this. Again, I told you this thing is very static. Um, the other one is just a single pull. You know, imagine setting a pull, you know, where that far one is, and having a whole long straight approach to that pull. You know, for a lot of people, that's like their biggest fear is having to. Do a long straight canter to a pole. But the, the reason why that's hard is because there's not that ability to maintain the same canter. But that practice is critical for the ring. So because it's hard, doesn't mean you should avoid it, it means you should do it a lot. So what we'll do is we'll add a single pole and then you're going from the pole to this. And so imagine if we, we have a single pole and once you can do the pole correctly, then we'll complicate it by galloping to it, and then you pick your spot for where to start adding. And you'll add as much as is healthy for the canter, because we don't want to take too much out of it. It's not really good practice. And then, so you finish that pull with not very much canter. And then I'll decide I want to do five here. So very quickly in a U-turn, I got to get the canter from a very, you know, uh, short strided canter into, in a turn, into a much bigger canter to do the five correctly. That process is actually very hard, but it's important because you, on, on course you need it. Um, if you're going from, you know, walking a three and a half, and then you have a U-turn to a triple combination where you're coming in on an oxer, you need to get your power immediately. Um, and that's the exercise we'll use to do it. And also, that is how I would teach turning. Because if you could canter your stride on a known track, then you can turn. Um, I think most of the times people don't. I'm scared to do that video. I'm going to do a turning videos, but I'm just scared because it's too big of a topic. Um, but I think people too often, they try to turn by force. This is, if you can do that collected to moving up in five here on a turn, you could basically do any turn. It's, it, it really, it, it does its own I like to do a lot of things when I'm working where you make one change 
and a bunch of other stuff happens without you having to think about it. And that's one of them. If you could do that exercise, then all these other things just sort of happen. And it's a great feeling when you don't have to think too much about it. Um, any questions? Should we lunch it? You can say. Lunch it. We're going to take 45 minutes uh, for lunch, and we'll be back in 45. We'll be back in 45 minutes after we eat lunch. All right, let's eat.
work specifically on the ground pole. over the fences. We need the flat work and the work on the ground pole to be perfect. So I'm going to warm him up and then we will uh, work on this pole to show you what we do. So it's important when you, normally we'll, we go for a longer walk before we start. Um, let the horse just walk and move and, and then what he's doing right now when we first start, um, we never He's just, he's just trotting, you know, he's not really engaging, you know, mentally so much. You're just letting him move, you know, you'll see some people get on and just immediately start grinding on him. I don't really think that's a great way to go about it. Um, so, you know, we warm him up physically first and then we take a little short break and then we start working on the mental side, making sure the buttons are working. Um, Eric would say put uh, like oil in the gearbox. Um, you know, it's like if you come out of the, you know, you, you just got up and you, you know, you need time to warm up and get ready to work. Um, and, you know, what he, what Eric was saying about, you know, slowly building up the horse, especially with those younger horses, you know, that's where the consistency at the barn pays out here is because you have to do that to consi continually make progress forward. Um, because you know, when you get a horse, they're not, they're not a static thing. They're always changing. Even if they're not a young horse, you, you know, they're always changing. And so being able to change them accurately uh, is, is important. Um, and a lot of this work is about, you know, yes, training them physically, but also maybe even more so training them mentally um, so that they, you and the horse understand what you're, what you're asking. Um, and I'd rather get them to... Uh, mentally understand what I'm doing rather than physically um, you know understand like if I'm trying to collect them they under they mentally understand what to do but they might not physically be able to well that's easier to work on than getting them to mentally understand and you see there's not like a huge bend in his neck you know but he's He's present, he's engaged, but he's not like, you know, you're not, we're not grinding. He plays a little bit, but you know, who cares? Another thing I really hate when I see people doing this, look at Eric's feet. There's very little motion in them as he's going around. So he's able to use, put his foot, on, you know, use his legs whenever he needs to, instead of always having to do it in rhythm with your trot, yeah, or with your post. Sometimes, occasionally I'll test if, if uh, I'll go on the wrong diagonal if, if I'm trying to see if I can adjust where their shoulders are in a turn at the trot. If they lean out or lean in, you can adjust that a little bit, but it's more of a, a, a tester than like a, a habit. Um, and it's really important because all this is, you, you know, all this stuff is carrying over to the goal that you're doing. You know, Eric is there and he's riding and he's working with the horse, but he's not, he's, A, he's not grinding and B, he's not doing nothing. Um, he's, you know, engaging with the horse and, you know, actively being there. You can see he's, you know, he's not just going around the perimeter of the ring. You know, he's, he's doing exercises, he's changing things up, he's keeping it active uh, for the horse. And in, in so doing, he's also getting it, there's also, you know, training elements to it, and then there's also preparatory things for the, you know, the, the flat work to come, or the pulls, or if you're jumping, you know, all those things, you, you know, like I, we were saying earlier, you don't need to jump to learn to jump. Um, 
And also when a horse is moving, you know, well and light like this, they're much healthier. You know, their movements are, not only are their movements healthier, but physically they'll be healthier. They'll be healthier and stronger. So, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with fewer physical issues and, and then you can get an even stronger horse because you are dealing with fewer physical issues. Um, it, I mean, it's not a visual thing so much as, uh, helping keep the hair on one side. Um, I'm scared of you. And you know, wh the way we're talking about connection in a horse, what we really mean is, is it's almost picture like an infinity sign laid on its side. Uh, well, that's how you normally do an infinity sign. So basically what you're asking for is the hind end to come under the horse, pushing the front end up. And you know, you're picking up the canter. It's an upward movement instead of a, a, a speed movement. So the hind end comes over, pushing the withers up, the withers come back down and the whole cycle turns back. You know, and, and that's, when you're moving, when a horse is connected, that's more how they're moving. When they're inverted or they're not connected, it's more of just a, uh, it's a flatter movement. But again, we're, if we're working on trying to teach them how to jump, you know, we need to, elements of jumping are in the flat work as well. Counter canner. So when he does that, that's more of a test before you do a full counter canner. You just test that one little turn and then you, um, because it's easier for them to understand. And when he's collecting there, you know, that, that collection got a little bit out of sorts there, but he wants the horse to come under themselves even more, to shorten the canter, but he doesn't want to, he's, Eric's not doing the work for the horse. You know, he's, you don't see him like leaning back and like, you know, really leaning into it. It's not so much of a physical work as it is, you, you know, the horse is understanding what he's asking and Eric is not asking beyond what the horse is capable of. You see how much more the hind legs come under the horse in that collection? That's what we're trying, that's what we're training. Not only so you can collect uh, in a line, but also that movement's what you do when you take off. When the horse takes off, that, that movement is, is the same. And you also see he works at a bit of a faster pace than you're used to. You know, he doesn't so much Eric's not one that holds really at that more collected canner. You know, he'll, he'll or that, sh that slower canner, he'll do the collection and then he'll go back, which is more akin to what you do when you're, um, uh, when you're on course. I think there is some uh, strengthening elements that are good to hold a, a, a slow, but it's not an idle. You know, there's, there's not that weird idle that you're sitting at. You know, when he does that, he's, you see how much the hind end curves under, and, it, and it's a stepping motion instead of a stabbing motion. Uh, you know, he's doing this instead of this. And you see his... Yep. Um, and it's all about understanding, you know, he's backing up, but he saw a loop in the reins because the horse is knowing what he's asking. He doesn't, he's not being forced to do it. Um, but, and it's also important in between blocks of flat work to, to let them walk, both to catch their breath, but also that gives kind of a bookend. And, you know, sometimes flat work is an escalating thing for a lot of people. It just keeps escalating, escalating. And then, you know, things are getting frustrated or the horse is getting hotter and hotter, you know, mentally. And if you give them a chance, you know, things can 
Take a deep breath and calm down. So with a horse that's a bit hot or a horse that's a bit dull, does he always start off with that kind of forward pace, even if they're naturally a bit hotter? Is that kind of what he tends to like to do? Well, you, you, don't, want, you don't want the horse to be running away from you. So, you know, you're trying to get the horse to hold their, their, uh, hold their movement. Um, and that, that is a mobile thing. It's not the same on each horse. And each rider is also different. A lot of times I'll work a little bit more in a, in a collected, like a sitting trot. Um, so maybe, Carl, I'm going to start on, on a single pole. Where do you want me to put it? Oh, okay. I'm going to use one of those. And what I mean is that the first thing is to check how the horse is behaving on a single pole. Yep. Some horses will accelerate, some horses will jump it too high. Yep, it's just a canter stride. Because it's a pole, you know, they don't need to do anything. And also... A normal stride, so we start to check that. And, and, you know, you'll see people, like a horse will rush the fence. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll bolt at the fence. And the person will pull to maintain the distance, and then they'll halt after the fence. Well, you've already waited till after the event to work on it. You need to do it. We would do it back in a, in a pole, and we would halt. If they, get, if they get heavier, they try to rush the pole, we'll, we'll let them lean into it and basically halt themselves before the fence, which is where, where the action is. And, and like I said, he wants to make sure that the pole, you know, that we're going to do the pole correctly so that then the more complicated stuff can happen. You know, instead of having to work on the stride, while trying to contain the pole, uh, it just makes everything, you know, you gotta go, f you gotta build it one step at a time. And one thing I remember when I first started doing this in the lines is in the line I started to get distracted, you know, looking for my distance and, you know, being focused on the pole and not, and I, I, I wouldn't, I'd lose focus of the canter, and then I wouldn't, I, then the distance would go away, because the, dan the, the distance is coming from the canter. Um, and, and so you're doing the pull, but you're still working, even though now you have, uh, you know, a pull to uh, contend with versus when you're on the flat, you have nothing. You know, you can collect on the flat, but you don't know if it's the right amount or too much until you have the gauge. And that's a pretty neutral canter. It's not, it's not very engaged or powerful. It's just there and, you know, it, it's, it's connected, but there's not that much power there. You know, you could put, he could put in and probably, and will put in a lot more power, but still be doing six strides. But, you know, you, you have to build it from one step at a time. You know, you can't just, you know, come right out the gate and, and do it immediately. You have to, you know, do each step and they feed each other. You can also see how light the horse is, is in his hand and how consistent the canter is. You know, he's not going forward and coming back. You know, the canter is staying the same because he, he's working on maintaining that canter the whole way. You know, it's not, the canter is what brings that distance. And so if you lose that canter, you could still maybe get to your distance, but it's a lot rougher and less smooth. Because you need it to be the same on course. You know, if you do a jump off and you have no control, you know, no ability to canter, then you don't, you can't make it around the course. So we're, we're training these things in a much more simple manner. You know, we're not jumping a jump off course at home. 
the stride is staying underneath him and, and is moving in, you know, that infinity sign that the canter stays the same. It's a, he's doing five, not six, but you could see there's not much that looks different. Um, and that, that's the goal and that's how on course things are smooth. Because in the bigger canter, he's not trying to run away. The horse isn't stronger in his hand. He's going straight after and making a, a more squared turn, and he does the same on the approach. And that's another intentional thing. You want the whole line to be straight, and that squarer turn, it, it, you do that because that's an intentional turn as opposed to just letting the turn happen without you intending to do it. You know, each element is done with intention. You know, Eric picked up the canner, says, I'm going to do five. I'm going to turn here. I'm going to keep going straight. Everything is done with intention before you get there. You're not just picking up the canner and then making do with what you got. You know, you're creating that before you even get there. And then the exercise tells you if you've done that correctly. And if you haven't, okay, you come around, you do it, you make an adjustment, you do it again. But that's what it, it's, it's indicating to you if you are doing your job correctly or the job that you intended to do. Like I said, be able to always know what canter you're in. Like if you're driving the car with the manual gearbox, you get to know what gear you're driving in. Same on the horses, what, what range, you know, how big the stripe should be to do six and six how big the stride should be to do five and five. Now we're gonna do seven and seven. So do you see, the stride are gonna be shorter, but I, I want to keep the same rhythm. The goal is not to go slower because I want to do one more stride. I go shorter because I want to keep the impulsion. If I'm jumping, I, I need some impulsion to jump even on short stride. So that's what we're gonna work on now. So doing seven and seven, I need a shorter canter, a good rhythm. And this then, you know, once you know these canters, then you can, like we were talking about earlier, you can take what you walk, and then you can, you, in, on course, in the saddle, you can feel, is this the canter for six here? This line walks like six, so you know. That's two more strides than he was just doing, and there's so much energy there because that's what you need. It's not about physically getting it, you know, physically like, I got the seven. It's about getting it the right way and then also continuing after. You don't just like let everything go. Can show you another way to do the seven. Can you do it poorly? Yeah, I can do it poorly. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's important to show it done correctly, but it's also important to see poorly. So he's way less connected, way less energy in the canter, his reins are longer. And see how he's kind of falling behind his legs? You, you know, he's, you know, Eric is intentionally giving less support, and so he almost breaks down to the trot. And look, he did physically get the seven, but in doing it that way, if you put a wide oxer there, you're not going to survive. And, and, and I noted there was a minute there where he almost broke to the, to the trot. And that was because Eric was less there. He was less a, you know, a partner with the horse and kind of just sitting there on the canter instead of you know, engaging in it. Just as Carol said, if I have a big wide oxer here, I have no chance to pass. I will land in the middle. So we need to teach the horses to be adjustable, but if you have a short distance, they need to be able to shorten the stride, but keeping the impulsion that they need to jump. Yep. Can you do some uh, collecting? Yeah. And then the next step, let's do five and six maybe. Yeah. And that kind of depends on each horse. If you have a smaller strided horse, you might start six to seven. Or you might start the whole exercise in six, and another horse, it might make sense to start him in seven. So it just depends on the horse you're riding. But like I said earlier, we don't change the length of the exercise for the horse. So he picks five, and he'll ride five and then do the adjustment. 
You see how he didn't do the adjustment before the middle pull? Right. Because on course you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you jumped in there and you're collecting before a wide oxer because of what's coming after the wide oxer, again, land on the oxer. And so you have to, you know, you have to do it intentionally given what you're gonna see on course. Because you could cheat, you absolutely can cheat, but that's not how you get better. And, and you can't really cheat on course, so you shouldn't here. And again, and also not cheating on B, but then on C, it's important to get it done, get your adjustment done so you still have enough energy. Again, it's not about physically getting the strides, it's about getting them the right way. And you also see when he makes the adjustment from B to C, you know, it's not just land and pull. You know, it's, an, it's engaging with his legs, seat, and hands with the horse. You know, it's not a single aid that's doing it to get that adjustment the way he was doing on the flat. You know, it's carrying the work that he was doing in the flat into this, this exercise, which is carrying the flat work to the pulls, to the jumps. It's always hand, seat, and legs together. In an ideal world, word, ideal way, you're indicating what you want with your hands, but it's your seat and your legs are actually doing the work. Because if you just pulled and you didn't deliver enough energy, you just fall into the trot, just like he almost did when he was doing it poorly. You know, you, you're not doing all the work by forcing it to happen. You're saying, we're going this way, and then your seat and your legs are the ones that are metering it or monitoring it, you know, adding a bit more energy, a little bit less to do the, the collection correctly. One thing very important is that once the horse is in the system, we are dealing brain to brain. I don't force him to do the thing. I give him the indication and he says, okay, I get you. I know what you want. And he gives it to me and we work together. We don't work against each other, like forward and pull against to, to shorten. It's, I give him the indication, and he's, he's working with his brains to give it to me. And that's, that makes a very big difference in the ring, that you don't have to fight against a horse that did, doesn't listen to you. So it's very important, when you, even when you flat your horses, is first of all to deal with the horse's brain, first of all, not with his body directly. You, don't, you cannot go direct to the body without dealing with the horse's brain. It's very important then they know what you want, and they are willing to give it to you. That's very important. Should we try four, Carl? You want, you could try four, yeah. How is he at four? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll find out. I have not used this one with him yet. We could also try five and seven. We can try five and seven first, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's to go completely all in. So again, he's not over cantering. You know, you could overdo the five and be collecting in the five to then make the seven. But he's not. He's getting the five, and then it's a bigger adjustment. So when you first do this, do the, do, do the collecting, you do have to take some of the energy away because the horse doesn't understand, and they physically can't do it. But as time goes on, you'll be able to do it while keeping more energy. And that's what the exercise is indicating. How much energy did I have to take out to pull it off? And so four, he's picking a bigger canter, but the horse is still with him, you see. He's not running away. You see, you, you're, you're able, you, you have to be able to keep the ability to canter even in a big canter. <laughs> He's enjoying himself. Now, of course, you have to cut the turn a wee bit in four. You know, you can't manage that. You know, you need, and this, you know, it's all gauging and working on all these skills that you do in the ring. 
And, you know, he's picking that four there. You know, he's not finding his distance and hoping it's big enough to do the four. And he's going to get it a distance that big in that kind of canter. It looks impossible and it feels impossible, but it only happens by you going to get it. It doesn't happen by you passively. It just showing up. It's a very active process to get that distance. I'm saying how active it is to make that distance for the four, you know, because you have to you have to actively ride it or else you're always going to add and then you're never going to have the canter. And then if you do that, you might get that jump and then you have to accelerate in the four. And, you know, if that's a very delicate fence, fence B, and you're accelerating to it, you're going to take off flat and long and you're less likely to jump it clear. And then even if you do, you're going to have way less control on the backside there because it might be another connected line. So it's testing all these things out and working on them and training them. It's just pulls. Like I said before, you're going to survive. Like it's not about survival. It's about you intentionally choosing an action and then you making that action come about. And also, I would say these distances when you want to do four, it's a very long distance. But you can make it become a normal distance. You right. just have to pick the counter that set for four in that distance. So you take a big, big bigger counter. It doesn't mean quick or flat. It means power from behind or range. So he pushes so much from behind that he goes farther with his four legs to get to get you know to get some ground. Yep. And then when you when you find the right canter with maximum power, with a super balance in front, from behind, back to front, those four that are nearly impossible to do become normal. Like he's not racing the four. He's got a very big canter, yes, but he's not, he's not kicking the whole way down to it. You know, it's, it looks very, very similar to the other numbers. You know, obviously there are some objective differences, I get it, but it looks very, very similar even though he's doing three less strides than when he does seven, um, it's, not, it's not spread out like this. You can't jump when a horse's body is inverted like that. And also, um, I was able to get the four in a big canter. Like I said, power from behind, big stride, but the horse stays in balance. He's not running at it. So because he's not running at it, even though I do only four, I have top control behind to do what I want. If I want to add a stride in the second line, it's not a problem because the horse does the four with power from behind, but stays in balance. So the control and rideability stay perfect in the second line. So that's very important. That uh, shows you a little bit uh, how we get the horses uh, 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 more in the system and rideable. Uh, Eric, can we do like a single pull so you can U-turn to it, so you, you can show, you know, being very slow at this pull because you collected and then accelerating in the turn, so you're, you're getting that work done as on course? So what do you want me to do? I'm going to put one pull out here. Um, your course is making this. This work. Um, so can we, you know, gallop at this and then pick your point for collecting? Collecting before. Yeah, collecting before, and then, and then. The yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted the turn to be short, to like, or to force it. I can move it out that way if you want. Um, and then go from like collecting here to like five strides. So in the turn, you know, you're, you're changing the canter. And so he's, yep. 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 To do five and five. Yep. So now we're tying, like we talked about before lunch, we're tying things together. So he's going to come in a big canter. He's going to pick when to collect. And that is a skill that shows up on course um, because sometimes you might not be able to run down a fence, but you're in a jump off, so you want to run to it, collect, but not be collected the whole way. And then after this collected uh, fence, 
imagine the pole is a fence, you don't have a very big canter, but you might need it for the next line. And so very quickly, so big canter, and he's picking when to collect. And that depends on the horse's flat work. And then right after the fence, he's accelerating again in the turn to then smoothly get. You overdid it. <laughs> yep, yep. But you see what. Yep. Yep. And you see, not only can he maintain a canter stride, it, it, a, a, a consistent gait, but he can accelerate while keeping everything together in that turn. So you're arriving at the next fence in the canter you need for that next line. You know, so you're, you know, you've probably had it where you jump a line and it gets a little bit forward and then the rest of the course is out of control and, you know, you can't really get that canter back. This is working on being able to maintain the canter in whatever canter you need and being able to change it so that you arrive to this uh, line intentionally for the stride that you need to do this line most healthily. And it's not like rushy and hopey and prey. You know, he knows he can collect to this fence and in a quick U-turn completely change the canter around for that next line. Um, do you guys have any questions? How big were the poles between the poles again? It's twenty. So the it's twenty meters, okay. or sixty-five feet seven inches. Also, uh, when we have questions, can we please use the microphone because they oh, can't God, hear us? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's why I repeated it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's twenty you. meters, and then twenty meters or sixty-five feet seven inches. Um, and like I said, it always no matter what, it stays the same. You know, I might be working with one horse more on six and seven strides, and then another horse I might be working mostly on five strides. But I don't, it, it, that just, that's horse to horse, but the exercise is always set the same way. Um, and it's important not only to get the distances right, but make sure the line is straight and the pulls aren't like cocked at an angle, because that will impact. Um, also, if you knock the pull, we'll get off, we'll fix it, even if we move it this much. You can, with a well-schooled horse, you can feel this much difference in, in the lines. Um, you know, with a horse that's like you know really well and that, you know, is cantering really under himself like that horse, if I were to change it and not tell him, he'd be able to pick. Um, so that's why it's really important to take your time to set the fence. Like if we, here, come here. I set this this morning. So if you look down the line, all the poles are parallel and none of they're not cocked in any way. It's very straight because if you're wanting to go straight, it's helped to not it, it it really helps to not be distracted by your the way you set the poles being inaccurate. You know, even if the distance is technically right. You know, if I then do this, that now looks a whole lot different, right? You know, it's still the same distance. I didn't change the distance or if I also if I do this, again, I didn't change the distance, but it looks weird, right? So it's important to really to set, take your time, look at a little bit, make a little adjustment to get it right before you do your work. Um, and then also, now that he's done the exercise, you can look at his, um, his tracks. He's very straight in all of the middle. You know, and that's important because some horses, you know, when you, when you go to collect, they'll start drifting one direction. And, and this, you could easily see that he was straight, you know, as, and then you could use that visual aid to say, am I getting better? You know, you might start off and the horse might have a lot of drift, but as you work, you know, working on things, getting better. Um, uh, another fun one that I'll do sometimes is I'll take the middle pole out. So it's basically 40 meters from pole to pole. And what I'll do is I'll, it's harder than this, but I think this is more real world effective, I'll say, I'm going to go do 13 strides. And then say, you know, 13 strides is doing six and six because when you do six and six, you have the one stride over the pole. So I know same canter for six and six, but I don't have the indicator of whether I'm correct by B. I only have it by the far pole. And then I'll do 13, then 12, 11, 10, nine, and then back up. And it's, it's hard that you're really picking your it further stretches it because you're, 
to move up a stride, to go from 13 to 12, you know, break one stride up into 12 pieces. That's the length you would expand each, or you would expand each stride. So it's not much, but that's, you know, it's giving you markers for how accurately you're doing it. And again, same, you know, you're, you're squaring the turn and keeping each stride the same. Instead of like accelerating slower, you, you know, instead of like doing work, it should look the same when you're doing, you know, in an ideal world. Um, but, and if it's easy, if it's easiest to do it in six and six, then start in 13. You know, start in what's easiest. Um, but this, this exercise, you could, if you could do this well, you're, if you can do this the way you, you saw him there, you're 90% there to jump any course you want. Um, because you've got your distances, you've got your canter stride control, the horse isn't running away from you, you, you know, you have all those elements. Um, like I said earlier, it's more exciting to, to jump, but I think you get way more positive work in per day by doing this than by jumping. And if it works at this, it basically always works while jumping. Um, another thing that this helps at is it's easy because it's set the same. You can compare left and right. A horse might be easier to collect to the left versus the right. Um, or your horse might be perfectly even, and then the next time you do it, left is harder than right. Um, and having it set the same each time allows you to diagnose that very well. And that, that is going to come into play when we talk next about soundness. You know, if, if they collect different left and right, almost always that's a soundness issue. Um, uh, other indicators would be drift. You know, if you're, if you're jumping a fence and they drift hard one direction, that, that's generally a soundness issue as well. Lead change asymmetry, left to right is easier than right to left. Um, uh, and other stuff like that. That would be something that I would talk to Philippe about. And actually, now we'll just start this conversation. So I want to show you how we work to, together and how we integrate everything because that then creates the full feedback loop to what happens in the barn. Um, and the big thing about uh, soundness is it's uh, very much a gradient. In an ideal world, you're not dealing with lame or sound. You're dealing with, I'm not getting the same range of motion here. You're not lame. Like, no one would ever say the horse is lame, but if you can improve that range of motion, then maybe you'll collect the same on the left than the right. Again, the horse is sound. Um, you know, it's not A or B, lame or sound. It's very much a grayscale. Um, and being able to understand that scale is how you optimize the system. You know, if you're very refined there and you're very, in, you know, everything is, is very detailed and, and very consistent, then when you're dealing with the product, meaning how the horse is feeling and how the horse is riding, you can then very accurately make tweaks to improve that where possible, when it's not, you know, a riding change or whatnot. Um, and it's very important. We're going to talk about jogging uh, horses. How many of you guys have been there when your vets have jogged horses or looked at them? Do you guys all generally understand the gist of what's happening? Okay. So that'll, I might repeat some stuff just so we're all on the same. Um, yeah, should we go do that now? Yeah. Um, let's go back to the barn. They're going to untack uh, Tito, and we're going to use him. Another thing I want you to note that about uh, Tito is we're doing that work on the flat work, but then when Eric stops and wants to talk, the horse has stopped. You know, is that a requirement? No, but that's an indicator that the horse is calm and is able to, uh, you, you, the horse is not in stress. You know, it works. Good, how are you, Eric? Um, can we bring him back so we could use him to jog? Uh, it differs. So, you know, some horses, it doesn't make sense to do the whole, um, yes and no. I think an ideal world when they're perfectly schooled, do them all. But sometimes it can be actually more harmful to try and go for the spread than to do 
a certain number of the iterations very, very well. You know, it's not, it's not so much about, success isn't doing all of them. It's about doing the, the very basic very, very, very well. Going back to the cross ties, we're gonna start, we're gonna talk about some vet stuff and then we're gonna jog that horse. our camera guy. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't think we're gonna talk much about okay you have a lame horse you call your vet. I think we all kind of get that part. Um, and the, the you know I but I think it's will be most interesting if we talk about the the tweaking and the refining stuff. And this is something where like, I might feel a change or a difference and we might add a therapy or we might add an exercise uh, on the flat. Uh, and that's where you really, you get to that level of refinement, you know, one step at a time, one, one steady step at a time, which again, requires the consistency of everything below it. Because um, if they come out different every day, it's really hard to say, you, you know, he's been to, to, to track you know, a consistent move. Again, that's what goes back to why we started where we did. Um, and a lot of times what will, our conversations will be about is you'll feel the trot, you know, the saddle move a bit differently that day. Um, you'll feel, you know, we talked about the differences right to left, um, drifting on course. Um, you'll, you know, you'll feel things, anything that has changed, and I'll then, I'll then go to Philippe. Most of the time I'll say, hey, you know, if it's out, He'll jog them multiple times a month anyway, um, just the way we've structured it because we want it to be everything to be very preventative based instead of, uh, you know, fireman based, there's a problem and then deal with it. Generally those problems all come, you know, you can see them coming. You know, if you have a horse, one foot uh, in front is bigger than the other, I guarantee you that is because they're putting more weight on the, right, on, on the foot that's bigger and generally you'll have a higher incidence of suspensory issues on that right front. I could just guarantee you that. And so if you know that, you can work on preventing that. And so you're dealing with a weight thing. So the issue is actually not the suspensory, it's why they're loading one foot more than the other. And so you have to find that. Most, almost all of our work on the vet side is either working with Philippe and the shoer, and Philippe will give direct notes to the shoer to make certain tweaks, slash Philippe will be there when the horses are shod, um, for, for two reasons. One, Philippe knows some things about the horse that the vet doesn't, or that the shoer doesn't, and also the shoer might pick something up that Philippe didn't. You know, if they're w putting a little bit more weight in one foot than the other, and that's different than time before. You know, that communication between those those groups are important to get that done. So we work mostly on, on getting their shoeing correct for that horse. And then we work almost exclusively in the top line because we're not getting to the point where we've blown a suspensory. So, and, and generally you blow a suspensory because there's some issues in the top line that went unhelped for a long time. And so, the, it, and when we catch things early, then again, it's, it's little tweaks. It's little stuff to their back, to, you know, working on their back and their balance um, that allow us to optimize, not only optimize the horse, but also reduce our instance of injury. Um, so why don't we pull them out and we'll just, yeah. Um, can I have the microphone? Yes, sir. You have to talk into that. To talk in that. Mm -hmm. Is it on? You know? uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the, I mean. <laughs> yeah, you're nice. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you, sir. So, Philippe Benoit. Nice to meet you. So, <laughs> it's kind of funny to talk in microphone when you don't hear this. Well, they're live streaming. Live streaming, okay, yeah. I know, I know. So, the, um, I think Carl said uh, most of the 
of what we are dealing with here. It's a different program in a way that uh, Carl has, was obsessed to have someone in care of his horses from the beginning. It's all about the welfare and having a different program in a way that we don't want to have to deal with acute problems and issues. Very acute injuries. Acute injuries. And uh, as you know, horses, it's a bit like us, you know, if you start to practice a sport, you can have definitely all kinds of injuries. The point is that once we manage the whole thing from A to Z, which starts with nutrition. We started with feed today. We yeah, went, okay. That was the first thing we talked about. So that's perfect. Okay, so nutrition was the first thing. The second one, obviously, because it's a redundant, let's say, thing you have to do on horses is shoeing. And the other redundant thing you have to do is to ride. So you want to make sure that you ride, which is also your contact with the horse, like saddle fitness is part of it. Uh, the right bit, the right... Uh, type of adjustment on a horse before you even think about calling the vet. The vet is normally here as a fireman. We decided to go exactly the opposite way. I am not a fireman. I was, let's say, employed by Carl and his family to look at the horses on a very, very regular basis. So once a week for sure, sometimes more, and go to the shows and make sure that at the show, every small details we know for every horse who has a problem can be adjusted before it even shows up. So a horse who has a, a flare on a joint, a horse who has a tiny something that we know is already documented because we know the horse so well, can be treated right away or we avoid this flare, for example, to be painful enough so the horse can still go in the ring and do his job. And the good news is we try to do all this without being too aggressive with treatment, injections of all sorts. We inject less than anyone else doing the same level that we're doing. Another, another big thing that we do differently is a lot of vets, they show up, I have a mic on me, um, they show up, they see a lame horse, um, they recommend some treatments, maybe you do the treatments. But there's more to that conversation that needs to come from you guys or the clients. That's, be, that, that's the question of what caused this, how could we have seen it earlier, and what can I change to avoid this in the future, and then the most important step actually making those changes. You know, your program is not perfect. My program is not perfect. So if, the, if ever an issue comes up, being willing to make any change that makes sense to combat some issue that you're dealing with, instead of just saying, this is the way I do it, and, and uh, you know, insert vet, you know, make the horse sound. You know, that, that's a very rudimentary way of looking at it where this is a very collaborative way that is, I would say it's more expensive on the front end of things because you're doing things before they get injured, but also you've spent a lot of money on your horse. So if they are, if you, if they are not sound and you're not competing, that's wasted money, you know? And so for me, more work on the front end is is just better. And if you miss something on a horse and you have to give him two months off, as you know, the boarding is not cheap. and They still eat the same amount. Exactly. And regularly, the vet bills are, hopefully for so far, less than a month <laughs> of boarding, especially in this area of California. Having said that, we have four types of relay. As we can have more. But the first ones are the riders, because they feel something which is wrong on the horse. The second one, but I would put all at the same level, it's not a hierarchic thing right now, are the grooms because they look at the horse every day, they take off, you know, the And we, we train them, you know, we do continuing the education to train them so that if they see something, they know what it is or they pay attention to see any difference. Um, so they, because they look at my horse's legs more than I do. You know, I absolutely do look at them, but they, you know, the... So I need them to be educated so that they can see things that potentially Interfere. are something we yeah. need, need to look at deeper. And if they weren't educated, that detail gets missed and we might have a, a worse problem down the road than if we caught it at first indication. Yep. Sorry, get to third. No, no problem. The third will be the farrier. Carl mentioned that before. And the fourth or fifth, if there's any other uh, professional, but mostly are the body workers, or physiotherapists, or chiropractors. We talked about Kate a bit. Okay, so perfect. So the main idea, again, is to group these people. They communicate together through, you know, text, whatever we decide to, to, to communicate with, but 
there is moments where there's always someone who finds something which could be of interest. So there must be also a strong respect between all the professions and all the people working together, which is not always existing in our industry because it is, like in any industry in a sport, a lot of ego. I am the one who finds out this problem. I am the one who discuss that. So we, don't, we are not there. We come back to the basic. Everyone has a say, and everyone can bring something in the pot that could be of interest one day. I mean, for us, the hardest, w the, the hardest one, but you know, you, you, it helps by picking the right person, the shoers. They're very much, they like to show up uh, when they want, do their shoeing and leave. And, and a lot of them don't trust vets. And a lot of them have good reasons because a lot of vets aren't very good or know very much. But that goes, that then is up to you guys, the clients, to talk to your shoer, to talk to your vet, to integrate them together, to make sure that you aren't just using some guy because someone said they were good. You know, they're working on your horse and you're paying them a lot of money to work on your horse. You, you, know, it's you, you know, it's your responsibility, but that integration is really helpful to carrying the consistency that you've built in the barn that we talked about this morning and turning the whole cycle around. Um, and, you know, you're building feedback loops so that the feedback is getting where it needs to go. Okay, and then at the end of the day, what we spoke earlier as well is there's a few ways as for me as a veterinarian, we go a bit more into details now. We look at the, you know, the, the feet is give you an idea of how the horse is loading. When you have a larger foot, the horse is putting more weight on that larger foot. That's kind of easy to understand. And so we want to have this feet equal. Otherwise, we have to find what would be the source of this overload. Some overload come from, you know, a joint pain, a fetlock, a carpus on the front end. It could be a hog behind. It could be a pain within the rear and when you look at these things a bit more in details you find out that if you can adjust the horse alignment of spine so that's why we are very strong about axial skeleton problems the horse suddenly can be more even on his four legs which means you're not dealing like uh, with a wobbly uh, poker table you know that you have always to cut one leg to see where you are no this is the main uh, axis of concern for me because I find out uh, that if the horse is happy in his pole neck withers thoracolumbar junction, obviously, you know, saddle fitness and interference with the rider and the pelvis, there's a good chance that this horse is going to be even on his four legs and avoid any source of overload, which brings you one day to a joint flare, a pain, a lameness, and then you'll, you'll have to back up again your training. And there's, a, there's another thing we look, because we were talking about how that's, you know, it's a gray scale. It's not sound or lame. Another thing we're going to be looking at is... Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is because we're not looking at a lame limb. You know, you, the horse is not doing that, you know, head bob that you know, we know in a classic lameness. What we're looking at a lot is how they're moving. You know, there's, you know, how th are they overloading the, the outside, the inside? Are they abducting or adducting? You know, what is the movement look like? It's not a lame movement, but what is the asymmetry left to right? And where could that be coming from? You know, if a horse is doing this, that you, you know that comes from a different place than this you know that just, just intuitively just makes sense but those are the details that when the horse is sound those details are what matter and those details are the indicators for that you if you can pick up on them you avoid the lameness showing up or you delay that onset so it's a lot about the posture and observation my observation starts when I see the horse in a stall. Like today, all of you have a different posture, and you know that. For some reason, you're going to put more weight on your left leg, left leg, even. <laughs> There's nothing right wrong leg. with that. <laughs> it could be one day, because you are young and in good shape, as far as I see. But you know, you get 40, 50, and you, this leg that you have been landing like this for the last 20 years, suddenly you say, oh, I have a hip pain on the right side. But why would it be right side and not left? Why would this horse have? more pain on this left fore for let's say the last six months and I still want to inject inject the same spot instead of knowing why left fore yeah. and not why this horse suddenly would have changed his axis or changed his load somehow okay and and you discover that people have a reason for that like some people would just listen to what I'm saying with Carl today and just get you know leaning like this somehow and kind of feel better, you know, like the horse who is leaning in his stall the same way. These are small signs of something going on. And the one I can tell you right now is lumbar pain makes the horse want to sit against the wall. 
or even you know some of you who are leaning on a pole. Philippe and I know this because we both have low back issues and have yes. had surgery to make it better. <laughs> so we know what lumbar pain feels like, and all you want to do is like sit backwards and it's sit backwards and open and kind yeah. of open your back. So anyway, this posture is very important. So as all of you are very interested into your horses and you want to see them, you know, with maybe a different eye, which is tough. You know, sometimes you want to have a second opinion in a way. Like the, the girl you're going to see soon, she was with me, uh, Morgan, she's not working, as she's right a veteran, there. she's young. Sorry, she's, she's hiding, okay, anyway. So when my horse used to be lame, I would ask another doctor to look at my horse because I felt like maybe I'm missing something because there's also an emotional part. Or, or, or the words, that's always how they move. You, you know, we, we've the all felt that, and I felt that in the past, and I will feel that way in the future. You know, it's just always how they move. Take but it I as could a fate. Yeah, people I could also say, well... They always are moving asymmetrically, or in really bad cases, well, they're always lame then. <laughs> I'm not saying your statement is wrong, I'm just saying the conclusion from it is, is, is that's different. That's the way he is. I love this spot. That's yeah, yeah. the way Well, that's he is. the way he always is. He always starts that way. Well, he always starts lame. I don't know what. You know, you know, but that's where, you know, different eyes, like he, Philippe yeah. was saying, are, can be important on those, some of the harder. To judge cases. Exactly. And even if it's a horse that you own and you know and you happen to be a veterinarian one day, you will find out that your emotion is pretty strong about what you want to see and you don't want to see something. So you go, oh my God, this is, oh no, that's my horse. You see what I mean? So you don't want to hear about that. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Or some, some riders, they'd rather not yeah, know that their horse is lame or not know that they have some compensation because that absolutely does it. You know, when you're riding, you're then thinking about that. And so some of them, some riders actually really top like top 50 in the world riders keep all that stuff separately. Um, now, obviously, they're still some of the best riders in the world, so obviously things are still working, but for me and what I believe for the future going forward, those little details are mattering more and more than they have ever meant in decades past. Yeah. Um, so I think you will see more people much more educated about those details and much more in command of those little things. And when it comes to, okay, horses, as any animals cannot talk, but you know, you listen to them carefully, you get a lot to learn. Uh, let's talk. If, if you go to, yeah, we're going to go directly over there. You can keep talking. In a, this, uh, in a sport business in general, any athletes, you know, who go at the level of these horses go, go uh, you look at tennis men, you look at basketball go player, you look at baseball player, yeah. they do have a pretty yeah. strong follow-up on the medical side. And they have a physiotherapist Dirt. like who comes to take care of them like at least twice a week. At least, if you are at the top level, it's almost like you have a massage every day. It's almost like you train and you know exactly where your heartbeat is going to be, your heart rate, your um, lactate. Let's walk to so, the dirt. Yeah, we're going to walk to the dirt. So we can go this way. Um, as we're walking, uh, so we and you've probably seen with your own horses, you jog them on the hard ground. Now, there's a reason for that, but there's also a reason to jog them on soft ground. So, on harder ground, you are Sorry. going to see much more joint issues and bone pain issues because things are harder. On softer ground, it's much more soft tissue. I guess you're going to walk straight. Um, uh, because Morgan. there's more suspension. Sorry. Think of running in sand. You know, your calves get sore really quickly. Uh, deep sand. So, there you is a straight. benefit back to hard and soft. Um, and when you're doing soundness evaluations, they might be sound on the hard, but you just got off them on softer footing and they were lame. You know, the horse is still lame, but so you have to then not just say, oh, they're sound on the hard, so they're sound. You know, there's, and so he's, what Philippe is doing is he's looking at how Tito's moving, how he's abducting or adducting, how he's landing, you know, how so his my, general posture is. So the, these grooms are trained to, to do exactly what I want to have on a horse when I do a f my examination. They so first she's go, doing a figure eight. Yeah, so she starts on a straight line, which helps me to find out if there's any asymmetry of the movement of the head, neck, pelvis. That's pretty easy from behind and from the side. The figure eight is interesting because you can see the horse, how he bends left and right. And if how he transitions from a right turn to a left turn. Exactly. Then you look at every limb one by one, and you look at the swing the way he lands and then comes backward. So we call it the cranial face and the caudal face of the stride. So cranial face, caudal face of the Vets stride. Let's have all these words that make no sense. So I know, 
but Carl loves them too because he <laughs> wants to be very professional and he is. So that's the way you can look and appreciate sometimes a horse who has a lower limb or upper limb type of pain. Like a bit like you, if you go like this with your shoulder and arm and you cannot raise the sky, most of the time it's your shoulder which is painful. If you want to grab something and do this movement, it's more or less your elbow or fist which is painful. For the horse, it's a little bit similar. When you have a defect of swing, it's mostly carpus, shoulder and neck. When he has a hard time to push back and put the pressure of his foot and fetlock behind, obviously it's more distal limb. So distal means the edge of the limb, the end of the limb, and it's going to be fetlock, pastern, and foot. I think an easy way to break them up into two groups is the swing phase, so when the leg is swinging, and loading or landing phase. So like, are they, do you feel it when you're riding when they're going up, or do you feel it when they're landing? And those two have different sources. But just under, even if you just say, if you go to your vet and you say, hey, you know, the swing phase on the right front is feeling different than the left front. You don't have to know anything more about like where it might come from, but just that added detail is important. Now, of course, you always can go farther and you can, you know, start tracking generally where you're going. But, you know, landing phase is a concussion, you know, you're landing, you're putting weight on. So something in that load bearing structure is not happy. Where in swinging, there's, you know, you can start to figure that out, you know, just thinking about what's happening in the swing phase. That's different than the landing phase. So. That's where the communication between Carl and Eric and myself starts to be interesting because they can also see sometimes the swing which is different when they ride because they see both front limbs. I'm going to watch behind, I'm going to see also the horse from the side. That's how you can appreciate because you cannot see the swing phase if you look at the horse only from behind. And I know a lot of colleagues can you know, change their position towards the horse, which I think is very important because if you look at just at the horse from behind, you see just the butt and you see the front end when he comes back. But it's very tough to appreciate this type of range of motion unless you're exactly sideways. So do you mind jogging one more time? And I will give you a trick to evaluate either the limbs or the upper. <laughs> yes. So you're going to jog two, two it's times. It's great in a row. because it's so basic. Yeah, it's very basic, but you're going to love that part. Because people sometimes see the horse moving with his limb, could be lame or not. So the trick is to try to eliminate either the limb or the back by using your hands this way. So on the way back, I want you to just look at the top line of the horse, so hide with your the, hand. block the legs. Block the legs with your hands. And now Depending on the, the problem, you'll see a lot of different stuff. Like you might see a really lame horse because they're head bobbing. But if you take the body out and you just look at the legs, they don't look as lame. So it's a, you know, that doesn't mean they're not lame. It's just a trick to kind of... Especially because this horse is sound. So, <laughs> so, so far. So my point is very interesting because you, it's nice to see the whole horse, but sometimes your eyes are kind of going up and down, up and down all the time, and you don't see exactly if there's a lameness or if the back is sore. And to see only the back movement, this is what I do. And then I want to see only the legs. And if you have a horse which is head bobbing because sometimes they try to bite or cheek with or fun with the bit, you can only see the limbs, and sometimes you see the limbs are pretty nice, so the head bobbing has nothing to do with the lameness, it has to do with his behavior. Yeah. So that's how you can differentiate both by just having this little tool, which is your hand. So it's a very expensive tool, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> just go like this. But you, the amount of information you get is very interesting. So uh, do you want to start? So yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we, 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 did, we did straight line, we did a figure eight, and then we also will do, soft. and hard and soft ground, we'll do on both, and then also we'll jog them in a, in a circle. Um, because sometimes they're way sounder in a straight line than on a circle. And that is an important data point because, you know, there's different things going on in a circle than on a straight line. So if they're sounding in a straight but, you know, lame on a circle, that's giving you information. So the horse is also beside, again, the lameness. You can see the way he orients his body with a long line. The horse is perpendicular to the ground. He has a nice move, a nice bend. I like that. That's, it's also part of the horse education by Eric, but it's part of the soundness and wellness examination. And I think what's Otherwise, really important to understand is you really don't need to know what you're looking at. As long as you can describe it. You can say the left front on a left circle is going way more inside than the right front on a right circle. You don't have to know anything of what that means. That's just a pure description. But that description is important and, and, and that being able to see those details is important. But again, you don't have to know what it means. You're just seeing a difference. 
or he's more tilted in to the right or to the left, or you know, anything, you're just describing asymmetries. And with COVID, I find out, because we had to do a lot of telemedicine, that some riders like you, even young, had to observe more and tell me what they felt, you know, over time with videos and things. So even Carl being remote, sometimes we could almost make a diagnostic by, by phone and video. You know, I don't, I don't like that, but we, we can do it. Especially when I'm on the road, if he's not at the show and I'm feeling something. Um, so you guys, uh, have, if you've seen your vet look at your horse, you've seen flexions. Um, Basically, you're, you're flexing the joint, different joints depending on what you're looking at, to try and see if there's a negative response to that flexion. Um, another tool that he will use, which is the one in his hand, is called a hoof tester. It, it, you guys have probably seen it. You squeeze the hoof with it. Generally, people use it for finding out you know, if they have an abscess or there's a hot nail or that sort of thing. But he... Uh, so he'll squeeze around a little bit, and then there's even a dynamic test, which you don't see often. Philippe does a lot where he'll squeeze and then jog. It's similar to a flexion, same idea behind a flexion. You know, if you squeeze the foot and then ask them to jog, a lot of times if you're dealing with some foot soreness, because that's what he's looking for there, is their foot soreness. We're not so much looking for abscess or anything like that. It's trying to figure out, again, where the problem is, or is there a difference? Um, Another big thing uh, that Philippe will do is if there is a limb that doesn't look so good, he'll start flexing the other limb first. Like if, if you obviously can tell the left front is worse than the right front, we'll start on the right front. Because if you start flexing the left front, you can make them more lame and then not see anything on the right front. You know, you'll have to put them back in the stall, let them cool off a bit before you do it. Um, also, it's important to jog them correctly. So we work a lot with the grooms on working, uh, on teaching them what we want and teach them how to get there and maintain it so that, because if the horse isn't jogging correctly with the groom, it's harder to see anything that the vet is doing. You know, if they're moving around and dicking around, you know, while jogging, you know, it's less easy to see. So in this, in this hind flexion, what Philippe is doing, he's not only flexing, but he's he'll pay attention to the weight. How much weight is he holding? And then if he flexes the right hind, he'll compare that weight to what he felt on the left hind. Um, again, the big thing, we're just looking for asymmetries. We're not, I mean, we are looking for lameness, of course, but before you're lame, you're asymmetric. This could be very, very mild. Well, you can see he moved different with his left hind there than when we first jogged him. Was it lame? I'd say no. Was it visible? Sure. You know, and, and that, that is all important details that then lead you to making your adjustments in the barn or if you decide that there's a treatment or something the horse needs. Yeah, I did. And some of the flexions are a quick one. You'll, you'll flex it and then go. Some are more of a hold. And that just depends on what you're... See how when they don't jog right away, you know, that can get in the way of what you're looking at. So I would say that also looks different than when we jogged him without, but it looked the, the difference looks different right hind than when he flexed the left hind. Do we want to talk about that? Okay, so we have an app that uh, is really cool. It, um, you use your phone and you video your horse jogging. And then it, using a lot of awesome software, tells you how symmetric your horse is moving. Um, and you do it over time. Um, I need to update mine. Um, uh, over time, you, you add things together, uh, you, ha well, you have a bunch of videos so you can, uh, you can track them over time. It's like weighing the horses. Um, no data points like needed on the horse? Like correct. The no, no data points. He's, he's doing it right now. He's, um, the, unfortunately, it's not 
out yet in the States. I only have it because I know the people who developed it and, and we've since invested in the company. Um, but I, they were working on this for about two years. Um, and they wanted me involved a while ago, but I thought it was impossible, so I didn't want to didn't want to lose money. So I said no, but apparently I was wrong. <laughs> so anyway, the idea is to have a baseline because sometimes the vet, you know, you can be tired at the end of the day. You feel something, you see something, so ah, you know what, it's fine. And eventually, one week later, the fine becomes unsound, and unsound can be, as you know, a scale of one to five. This is a kind of a scale that was initiated by equine vets a long time ago, 20 years ago. And so now we say horse is zero, which is fine. One, two, three, four, five. I five think it should be out of 10. Yeah, anyway, me too. But it's for nine, because it's zero to nine. So we have 10 scale. But yeah. the, the main idea behind is to have a baseline. But the other importance of a baseline is if you start to work on a horse which is unsound and you start to block in to find where the lameness comes from, then you need to know how much percentage you just increase and to count those. Otherwise, you don't know where you are. Yep. So again, the main idea is to come back to this baseline thing, and so this app, which was developed uh, by uh, in some Sweden, in Sweden yeah. ended up to be an application where we have like the points on the horse, which makes an idea of how much movement there is from the pelvis and the head, and this is like motion capture video, except that the app recognizes where the spots would be, all the dots. When you see Avengers, what they do with all the spots and kind of um, funky stuff uh, in these movies. It's exactly the same, except the dots are already kind of put on the horse virtually. It's amazing. Um, so and it, it's like weighing. You know, you track it over time. And also, if you do have an injury, it will help because as you're rehabbing through the injury, you can hopefully see, you know, it improving. Um, or if you pick a treatment that's not working, you can pivot quicker. So anyway, this app will tell me if there's a minor thing that maybe I could not catch with my eyes. Okay, keep in mind, I have the data, I have all the recording. And if I start to block this horse, I will see how much percentage I improve each time. So then I have something else which is a bit more objective than just my eyes. The day I have, you know, done too much and I am <laughs> ready to go to bed. Too much rosé wine rose and you're just, wine. you're not a... Hanging out with Carl with different whiskey and walking, talking. I <laughs> <laughs> and you're looking, you're looking at the horse like... Uh, exactly. So that's where we are. And I'm happy to share. This is going to load. It's going to take another 15 minutes. Well, I can show a thing of Coachella. Yeah, you can if show you want. a few, but uh, it's interesting. So because you saw this horse, it was interesting to share. Yep. It's pretty sound to me. but So this is how you can see over time. Um, so each, and we'll go into more detail here. So gray means, you know, objectively sound. Uh, then it obviously goes uh, yellow, uh, uh, yellow, orange, red. And then if we, what I can do, is this, and I did the note, day after five-star Grand Prix. So I know how the horse is moving the day after the five-star Grand Prix. Um, and basically it's measuring the difference in height of these, uh, my God, yeah. So there's a difference in height between this peak and that peak. And that difference in height is what created this green bar here. This gray bar is created from a difference in trough between these. So that's what it's measuring. So where are the data points coming from? Is it top of the head, like left front? It's, it, it's basically the whole horse. Wow. Like they, it's a, they digitally map it and it recognizes where pieces are. Um, um, yeah, let's go back to the barn. Where can we go now, Brooke? Oh, wow, really? Um, do you guys have any questions? There was a lot of content there. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, they sleep, S-L-E-I-P. They're Swedish, so, you know, they make up weird words. Uh, um, it'll probably be a couple of years. Um, I, I'm trying to get them to go faster, um, but they're... Uh, this is a beta version. Oh, okay. And they're testing it in Sweden right now. Um, anything on the vet side? How often do you flex them? Every time they get looked at? Or? Um, here, let's just stand inside so we can get out of the sun. Um, we flex them. That depends on the horse and what we're looking at. You know, it's, it's not so much like a... Like some vets will have a, they always have basically the same system of, of flexing. And they, you know, they go from 
this flexion to that flexion to that flexion to that flexion, and it won't change. What you saw Philippe do is he only did three flexions, and he uses each flexion to guide where he's going to go next. Um, and so it very much depends on, on that individual horse on that individual day. Yeah. Yeah, it's called a solarium, and it basically keeps them warmer in the winter. Um, that one's old and doesn't work very well, but... They have a lot of Europe. Yes, yes. But it gets quite cold here in the, in the winter, so it, uh, it's helpful then. Um, yeah. Oh, we should talk about the board. So again, you saw the board for the feed room. This is our board for riding. So, so everyone's got their own board, and you know, there's, I'm not saying one board is better than the other. It's more about understanding why it's designed the way it is so you can design it for you. So we needed to put a lot more information on our board, so that's why the board is so big. Um, and some drawings Philippe did. So obviously you got the horses, uh, their breed in there when they were born, and then each day they'll, what they did is filled out, and then also their treatments are in orange, and when the treatment is done, it gets ticked off the list so that you can visually see. Um, then we have general notes for each horses. We have their dates of their, um, uh, their, you know, their flu rhino and that sort of thing, and their farrier dates so that we can organize the farrier you know, weeks in advance, so that you know it shows up on time, and we're not like, oh shit, when were they last fed, or fed, uh, <laughs> shot, that too. Um, and then at the end of the week, we will take a picture of this and save it, so that we we keep a log of what uh, what they're doing um, over time. Um, yeah, and then obviously since my horses aren't here, it's not being filled out. But they, you know, we on the road we still do the same thing. It's just a smaller board on the road. Um, um, yeah, and then this is the chart uh, for weights. So you can, if you see that, we're, we're fluctuating very small. We even weigh the little ones, too, because <laughs> that's fun. Um, yeah, what should we talk about next? Anything I haven't covered? Nothing? You're very thorough. <laughs> um, okay. So software, we do use some, all of the horse software things don't really work for our operation. Um, I, know they, I know some operations that use them, we haven't really found one that really works. I think they're starting to use Barn Manager for some stuff, but not others. So it's kind of hard, you're trying to use an application to make your lives easier, but you can't use the whole thing. Um, which is, you got to weigh pros and cons of, of, of that. Um, there's another application we use, it's not a horse one, called Basecamp, um, and it's very, um, it's meant more for like small team development teams for, you know, for tech and, and other companies, that sort of thing. So it's very customizable. You know, you can kind of customize it to your operation. Um, and we use that for like our general, um, our general reports. Like when Philippe looks at a horse, he'll write a whole uh, you know report, and that goes through Basecamp. Um, and then I can look it up on email, or I can look it up on Basecamp. Um, same with the body worker; it all goes through um, uh, Basecamp. Um, yeah. Can we pause? Yeah. Let's do it. Oh, all right, well, do we want to go back to the, how do you want to wrap this up? spend the day with us and Thank you, sir. just the thought he put into it and I think we all learned a lot and it was a ton of fun to hang out here and walk around and see how it's all set up. Well thank you guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun to it was fun to meet you guys and 
you know, look, you know, one thing I, I kind of noted on before, you know, there's a lot of things here that wouldn't make sense, might not make sense for you. And if I was doing, if I was jumping a different level, I wouldn't do a lot of these. So it's, it's tuned to what I'm doing. You know, it'd, it'd be like, you know, you wouldn't use the same motor oil in a race car that you would, you know, on your commuter car. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's very much tunable, and it's, and it's you, you know, you don't need any of this. Like, all this isn't required, but I want to show you it so you can see where you can go. Or where, you know, because I didn't know a lot of the possibilities until I met Eric and I met Philippe. And I was like, oh, wait, you can see a lameness before the horse is lame? Or like, you, you know, it, it just opened my, my eyes to what's possible and, you, you know, how much more refined things can get. Um, but it's hard, until you see it operating, it's hard to believe it. Um, and that was what I was trying to show today. You know, you don't need that water filter. You, you know, that's, that's really not a need. And even me, you don't really need it. But I was like, if we can make it a little bit better, let's do it. And it's the same with the ride. If you can make your ride a little bit better, let's do it. Um, yeah. Sorry. Cut you off. Sorry. And then do we have stuff from Melissa too, I'm pretty sure? Yeah. Okay. I'll give that to Melissa. I don't know where she is. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, so thank you. It was fun to spend the day, and I think you all learned a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Yeah, we'll just block out the numbers on it, but yeah.